Welcome back to the GTN show. We have so much to talk about this week. A 100 mile running record, 70.3 Timberman is back in action and some wild new shoe innovations which are inspired by space. Yeah, but the big topic this week, Olympic qualification. Who's in and who's not? Well, Yokohama WTCS this weekend has provided some pretty exciting viewing and we're about to delve in. Okay, to kick things off, we've got our React section. Now, Heather, I don't know if you spotted this. What do you think of this? So, Talbot Cox posted a story last week on Lionel doing a workout on his treadmill with a piece of paper pinned up in front of him, classic Lionel, and on that piece of paper said 7.29.29. Obviously posing the question, could you go under 7 hours 30? For an Iron Man. Could you go 31 seconds under? Well, seven yeah, hours I, was, I don't know if they realised that, but I mean, it would have been easier to go 7, 29, 59. Mm. Making it hard for themselves. Yeah, so. I mean, it looks like, you know, some good training motivation there for Lionel. We know it's all like about mind games when it comes to Lionel's training, so he loves a target. It's better than having Yan on his wall. Maybe he swapped it out yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, true. I mean, knowing that Yan's record is 7, 35, whatever it is, mm. then he's really trying to do one better, isn't he? He is, always. All right, well, next bit, um, obviously, We've got Ironman Tulsa coming up this weekend. A few athletes out there posting up stories, but one that sort of caught our eye was David McNamee, obviously a phenomenal athlete. Didn't have the best race at Ironman 70.3 St. George, and he has just announced that he's decided to pull out of Tulsa simply because, well, he's not feeling great. In his words, he's feeling a bit crappy. Yeah, it's quite a tough one to, to make the call, isn't it? Because you just never know, you know, things can change on race day, so he must be feeling really quite terrible yeah. to actually make that call now. Yeah, real shame. Um, I was. Uh, following him, he was saying how great he was feeling in the lead up to St. George and obviously wasn't, I don't know if he was kind of, kind of you know, playing his bluff yeah. or whatever, but um, hey, a, a real shame, we're always disappointed to see that. Yeah. But on a lighter note, we did see Kat Matthews out mm. there, yeah. she's getting ready to race and <laughs> well, you saw this as well, wasn't yeah, you? Yeah, I mean she is honing in, doing a full on course recce, but I think she went slightly off course. Mm. Yeah, on her lovely pimped out BMC time machine, and we know she's very particular about a setup on a bike on gravel. I'm sure that wasn't planned. I think from the post, there could have been a husband in trouble from that route planning. <laughs> that's that's what I'm taking from that. And imagine a brand new chain after that, brand new tyres, everything's oh. getting going to get stripped. Um, now, I, I spotted this one the other day, actually. They had the sound running track meet in California, which has oh, always has a stellar lineup. Um, but I don't know what you think to this clip, Heather, but who is at fault here? Oh my goodness, look at them all. There we go. All over the place. And look, he pulls him down. <laughs> so, I mean, my eyes, oh, it's the guy in the white vest. I can't vest. tell, there's several that um, I bet the referees had to watch over this quite a few times. Hands. Anyway, I, yeah. I, I mean, if you're not going to win, just be like, kind of, you know, ad admire the other runners who are better than you and <laughs> be gracious in yeah. defeat. Yeah, I mean, at least in a triathlon, you can get away with that without anyone seeing in the swim. Never said no, Mark. But anyway, Mark, I gather you have um, you did a little sort of race, do we call it, with, with triathlon Taran uh, the other day? Yeah, yeah. Um, so some of you have noticed and commented on my Strava and whatnot. I did do a little race with uh, Triathlon Taran. Um, and yeah, you're going to have to stay tuned. It's going to be going out on Taran's channel, hopefully this week, later this week. And um, we'll be sharing that on our channel as well. But essentially, it was a duathlon. I'm not going to give much more away. It was virtual. It was tough. It was hard. We had a couple of technical issues, partly my own fault, not Zwift or anything. But um, yeah, we got there and it was, it was good fun. And hopefully more of that to come. Oh, I look forward to us. watching it. So that 100 mile record we mentioned in the intro, well it was broken by someone doing their first official 100 miler. So, yeah, I know. So Sania Sarakin went for this and he got it in a time of 11 hours, 14 minutes and 56 seconds. It was actually in the UK, the Centurion track event, the 100 miler in Ashford. And to do this, he held a pace of six minutes and 45 seconds per mile, which is equates to a 412 per kilometer for that distance, for that length of time. And that's obviously not taking into account any breaks. So we would actually have had to run faster than that. Yeah, that's actually crazy. I mean, I tried to run at 
four minute per K for a sustained period of time at the weekend. I just blew up catastrophically. So <laughs> that is actually mind blowing. But in addition to that, after setting the 100 mile record, he continued to run for another 45 minutes to go after the 12 hour distance record. And he covered 105.825 miles, which is equ which equates to 170 kilometers. And again, he broke the previous record of 104.8 miles, which was also held by the previous 100 mile record holder. Now, interestingly, Sorokin actually grew up as a competitive kayaker. Um, unfortunately, due to injury, he retired from that and sadly turned to alcohol, cigarettes, and a lot of food, and apparently put on a lot of weight. But Fortunately, has turned to running and turned his life around. And actually, he was working at, yeah, seriously has. And um, he was working at a casino as a dealer and sadly through COVID lost his job, but turned his attention purely to running. And in his own words, he, he, he basically trained and lived like a pro athlete in the lead yeah, up to this. So, great. you know, big accomplishment after all of that. Yeah. All right. I think we're all aware of the boom in open water swimming, especially thanks to lockdown. I mean, it's an incredible thing to be able to go and do. Well, Triathlon England have just launched a new safety initiative in the UK to help get more of us swimming safely. And they've teamed up with Swim England and the Royal Life Saving Society to accredit a lot of swimming venues across the country. Apparently thousands of venues are going to be so signed up to this, basically in order to give really safe places for people to swim whatever your ability. Yeah, now from what I understand, these venues will be accredited provided they comply with safety checks. So by signing up to Beyond Swim, you'll be able to visit any of these locations and venues that you like, get a discount entering into them amongst many other things. So if you're interested, just head on over to www.beyondswim.org. Moving on there, we've got some nice news from PTOs. They'll be supporting with $15,000 in prize purse for the Copa Brasilia Triathlon on the 13th of June. Now the Copa Brasilia Triathlon has a bit of heritage. It's a 13 year old race. It takes place in Brasilia, which is a city that's host to the Brazilian and triathlon federation now the pro race is going to be a non-drafting format it's a 1500 meter swim 60k bike and a 15k run and they've already attracted the likes of igor amarelli and on the female side we've got pamela oliviera Okay, moving on, and Heather, you may remember us talking about Heather Fredrickson's book last year. It's called The Pursuit of Victory, which she certainly knows a thing or two about. Back then, it was only available in Danish, but now, excited to say, it's available in English and available worldwide too. Now, she's obviously had so many amazing results over the years, but a big year that stands out for me was 2014 when she won Challenge Bahrain and then went on to win High V 5150 World Cup, which both awarded, wait for it, $100,000 checks for first place. That's, That's big not, money in triathlon, isn't it? That's not bad, yeah. yeah. Well, she obviously went to the London 2012 Olympics and following on from that, of her 41 races, she was on the podium for 37 of those. And that included a world, world Championship title, a World Championship silver. She won three European Championship silvers and then had 10 victories over the 70.3 distance. So she obviously got a huge amount of stories to tell from the highs and the lows. And it's actually a bit of a quote we want to read out here. So if an 11 year career as a world class athlete has taught me anything, it's that we are capable of things far beyond what many people believe. Early in my career, I was told to stop I was told to give up on my pursuit and start a family. I never wanted to give up and I never stopped believing in what I was capable of. We should never give up on something we believe in. That's awesome. Mm. And there's lots of photos in here, which is great for me. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll flick through those yeah. later. Uh, awesome. Well, yeah, do go <laughs> check it out. The Pursuit of Victory. Hello, Fredrickson. Okay, final bit of news before we move on to some tech. And some of you out there may be quite excited to hear that Ironman 70.3 Timberman is back. Now, Timberman Triathlon has been running since around 2001 to 2016. It was taken over by Ironman in around 2010 and then obviously abruptly pulled from the schedule in 2016. But it's back, albeit at a different venue. Well, it is just four miles down the road in Laconia. It's set for the 22nd of August. It's going to be a lake swim and then a cycle one in the rolling hills, including a little stint around New Hampshire Motor Speedway, which should be quite fun. And the run finishes up with a bit of a trail run around the lake and then it ends up in downtown Laconia. And you'll be pleased to know that the entries have opened for registration just a couple of days ago on Monday. 
Okay, now for the tech news and starting off a little update for the Wahoo Element Rival watch. Now, similarly to the Wahoo bike computers and some other bike computers out there, they're now linking up with Training Peaks. So when you build a workout in Training Peaks or your coach does it for you, you can then sync that up with your watch so it will appear on your watch so you can follow it along and also tell you whether you're on pace or off pace. So I can stop writing a session on my hand and it disappearing halfway through a workout and doing the wrong number of reps. And yeah. No excuses anymore. I know, I'm looking forward to this yeah, one. Yeah, it does sound good. Well, moving on to some new shoe technology. Brooks have just released a new limited edition shoe that is inspired by space. Now this one has a decoupled sole. So when you look at it, you'll see it's got sort of a different back end and a different front end. So it's certainly pretty noticeable. But then the most sort of ingenious part is the fact it is injected with nitrogen injected foam for lightweight cushioning. Sounds pretty cool, Sounds doesn't it? Sounds futuristic. Um, and then just for sort of more for looks, it's got this translucent upper. So you're definitely going to get noticed if you're in this shoe. It's called the Brooks Aurora BL, and it was um, created in their Blue Line Lab. It's an innovation setup. And there are only at the moment 25,000 pairs of these shoes. It's very much a limited edition, but I think they're sort of seeing how it goes down. Um, they are going to cost $200 per shoe. Um, which I guess is kind of around the normal price now for a, for a specialist running shoe. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see them actually out and see if these could be the new super shoe. Who knows? Hopefully that's per pair of shoes, not per shoe. Did I shoe. say shoe? Well, I don't know. I mean, ma the maybe it is cost. $400 <laughs> for your pair of shoes. I don't know. Maybe that's what they cost these. But they have, what they have said as well is they might take some of that technology, or they are going to take some of the learnings and the technology from that over into the rest of their running range, which will be quite interesting. Maybe we're all going to be running around on space boots Yeah, soon. but I do, I do think at the moment they look a little bit more like they would be suited to Lady Gaga's feet at a pop concert. I, I've got to agree with you there. <laughs> well, moving on, and you've got to excuse me for talking about carbon shoes once again here on the channel, but given that it's Adidas and kind of the success that they've had with their carbon shoes, I feel like it's important to talk about these leaked photos. Now, it was it's only what we can assume is the Adidas Adi Zero Adios Pro 2. I hate how long they make the name in <laughs> Adidas. Um, it was Rispa Chabert, um, she was seen wearing these at the Milan Marathon, I think just the weekend just gone. Um, I've also seen other leaked images of this shoe where they actually, if you see the underside, they've actually exposed the energy, carbon energy rods as they call them from Adidas. They're actually exposed on the bottom. So, hey, it could be exciting. Um, I still am yet to, well, other than the, the on shoes, wear any of the other yeah. carbon They're doing shoes. a good job of teasing it. I mean, if they're getting you excited, I'm sure they're getting lots of other people excited as well. Okay, sticking with Adidas, but now something more understated, but I think from both of our opinions, more impressive. They have just come up with what is apparently the world's lowest carbon footprint shoe. And they've designed this and manufactured it with a collaboration through Allbirds. Now it's called the Futurecraft Footprint and it's designed like any other shoe, although apparently it's full carbon footprint from, so from when it's made to when it dies, if that's how you describe a shoe's life, is just three three kilograms of carbon, which is the equivalent of driving about seven miles in an average car. And to give you some context, this is about a quarter the compared to a normal running shoe. So a normal running shoe would be four times as much carbon that would be emitted to sort of make it. Mm. Now I like this detail because each pair of shoes, which are super light, I must add, 154 grams. Nice. That's very light. Yeah. Um, they come with their carbon footprint stamped on the side, detailing each stage oh. of the process. So you've got the shoe making, the packaging, transportation, use and end of life. And then in bold, it's carbon footprint, which interestingly is something that all birds do on their shoes mm. currently anyway. And well, maybe Adidas is going to roll that crap out across all their shoes. It'd be quite interesting. Um, this is a big topic though, and something that, you know, something does need to be done about. Running shoes leave a heavy environmental impact um, on our environment. So in 2018, more than 1.2 billion pairs of athletic shoes, of which 40% were running shoes, uh, were sold worldwide. By 2023, that's expected to rise to around 1.37 billion. Now, with an estimated 300 million pairs of shoes discarded in the UK each year, that is well, just an ever-expanding pile of yeah. plastic rubbish and waste yeah. that's just ending up in our planet. So it's really nice to see brands like this and, and such big brands like Adidas collaborating to try and improve on this. Yeah, and I think it's just, again, raising that awareness, isn't it? And if you do get bored of your shoe beforehand, you can still give it to a charity as well, which is another option.
Okay, now moving on to some race news, and we're excited to finally be talking about some ITU racing news. Now, this weekend we had WTCS Yokohama. There was a lot of speculation as to whether the event would even go ahead. Fortunately, it did. Now, things are really starting to heat up now with regards to Olympic qualification. Now, it's worth pointing out that every nation is different in terms of their Olympic qualification policy and also their process and the, their progress within that qualification. I mean, some nations have already selected some of their athletes, some nations have nobody selected at the moment. So we're getting onto that in just a moment. But first of all, let's talk about the racing itself. Yeah, OK, so I'll start things off with the women's race. And it was Summer Rappaport who actually led out to the swim. And it was fairly strung out, but not like significant enough that there wasn't going to be a group on the bike. However, Maya Kingmer and Taylor Nib soon made a breakaway. And those two worked together and put in a significant margin. And so much so that by T2, they had a two minute lead. And it was actually Taylor Nib who was the stronger of the two on the run. And she managed to sort of maintain that pace and keep off the chasers and finished first. But it was Summer Rappaport who came back up through the field to take second as Maya King, which just started to fade a little bit, but she did manage to hang on to third. Now it's worth noting before we go on to talking about the, the sort of how it's all working, but that was a one-two for America. And then Taylor Spivey actually finished fourth, another American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting indeed. To on to the men's, equally as exciting. It was once at Louise that stretch that swim out and put the pressure on early on. So much so we had Kristen Blumenfeld around 15 seconds back out of the swim and Alex Yee around 20 seconds or so further back. That meant that we had a small group off the front on the bike with a larger chase group behind who really worked hard to whittle that down and they did that meaning that coming into T2 we had a huge group coming in together and it seems like the damage was done initially just leaving T2 as we had four athletes breaking free of the rest. We had Jonas Schomburg, we had had Alex Yee, we had Heli Geens and Christian Blumenfeld. Now it was Jonas Schomburg that was first to fade and drop from that group and then interestingly the next to go was none other than Alex Yee which you probably yeah, wouldn't have expected. Yeah, well, I looked at the results and I was a bit surprised. I didn't know how it happened. Well, I think most people watching it thought, oh my goodness, Alex Yee in that group, he's going to win this. Um, I think perhaps just some of the work they had to do to chase back on and get that group working, um, maybe that just came to bite him. Um, so he was next to go, but then a fast-moving Morgan Pearson came through to take that third spot. And with a kilometre to go, it was Christian Blumenfeld that really put the hammer down. He went on to take the win. Heli Geens having to settle for second and Morgan Pearson finishing in third. Now before we go on, do you remember our predictions from last week? Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you do what? I can't actually. Christian Blumenfeld was mine. Oh. That's the only one I think we got between the, the four predictions. Yeah, I was. Bit. I mean, I said Taylor Spivey, she got fourth, which is yeah. quite good. Yeah, you did better than me on the women's because I said Katie Zafaris and then you, um, what happened to um, Von St. Louis? Yeah, he was uh, sixth or seventh. Yeah, okay. it's not terrible. No. Okay, maybe we shouldn't do predictions yeah. next Well, time. no, I'm, I got mine. I'm happy with that. Anyway. <laughs> All right, but the serious questions are around the Olympic selection. Now, in this period of qualification, there are five races in total. Two WTCS events, which obviously we've had one just gone in Yokohama. There's another one in Leeds, and then there's three World Cups, so Azarachina, Lisbon, and Mexico. Now, not all of the nations are going to send athletes or all of their athletes to these races, but these are the potential opportunities for countries to qualify slots and for athletes to qualify and get selected. Yeah, now we're not going to go through every single nation right now, but but I am going to focus just initially on the US team because things are really heating up there and this weekend proved quite exciting for that. Now before this weekend only Summer Rappaport had been selected for the US team and no men. Now because of the depth of field in the female US team they have to place in the top three in one of these races, which obviously Taylor Nibb did this weekend with her first place. So she's got a US selection. So that's two of them are leaving one spot remaining. Sadly for um, Spivey, she just missed out with a fourth place finish. But then Katie Sefiris, sadly way down in 22nd. Aww. Now it's worth pointing out that her father passed away around a month ago. So it's even just amazing to see her racing. But for someone that was so dominant in these recent years, it is, quite saddening that she could be on the cusp of missing out on going to the Olympics. Now on the men's side, they only need to make, I say only, they just need to make the top 
eight in one of these races, which obviously Morgan Pearson clearly achieved this weekend with his podium finish. So that's one of the US male slots already taken so yeah it's gonna be exciting to see how it all unfolds over there yeah and it's not as straightforward for the british side of things either especially for the men's we've actually had a few questions around that and understandably because yeah it does seem quite up in the air well here's one example from mike monteith on the next show please can you try to help explain why ali brownie wasn't racing over the weekend and what needs to happen for him to be selected for the games still unsure about how gb can achieve three picks rather than two and if it's down to alistair's performances himself rather than all gb athlete performances in these wtcs races or if it is down to him his absence over the weekend is even more confusing I think that's a pretty fair question yeah. because it is quite confusing. Now, the surprise in the men's team that is that currently only Johnny Brownlee is selected. His two-time Olympic champion brother, Alistair, is yet to be selected oh, and goodness. also doesn't seem to be racing. So what's going on here? Well, currently, Team GB have just the standard two spots. And similarly to the US and GB women's selection process, they need to get on a podium to secure a spot. Well, Alex Yi, as you'll know, got incredibly close to doing just that this weekend. So this is what we figured is going on here. Either Alistair is hoping that he gets a podium spot before the likes of Alex Yi, but obviously that's a risky game. Or alternatively, GB are working to get a third spot, which is possible. Mm -hmm. And to do that, well, what we understand is an athlete needs to be in the top 30 in the rankings and even potentially above the third ranked US athlete to almost nab a spot from them. Yeah. Are you still with me? Okay, so basically, Alistair is way down in the ranking, so he isn't going to be able to generate an extra spot. He's not going to get his ranking up to the top 30 by, yeah, unless he does a lot of races. However, there is an athlete who is happy to do a lot of races, and that is. At least we think so. Well, okay, he is, he's admitted he's doing them. I shouldn't put words into his mouth. He might not be happy. Uh, Tom Bishop is racing all five of these races that we've just talked about in the hope to get his ranking into that top 30 to generate this slot. And then we think the idea would be that Alistair would come along and do well enough at Leeds that he would be able to actually have a slot within one of those top three. But it does, um, yeah, it, it's very still quite confusing. And we are, I guess, putting things together from what we're gathering and it's here. It's a lot of speculation speculation because mm. obviously I'm sure Tom is there going well no I'm trying to get that yeah. third spot for myself yeah and if you're doing all that work whatever that second yeah. spot is that's Alex or Alice but then on the weekend it did look like Johnny Brownlee slowed down a little bit to let Tom Bishop go past him because it'll mean he would get more points because he'd be further up the ranking so is is Johnny actually helping his brother that way or is he helping GB it's a really interesting dynamic and we also saw the same in the women's race with I think it's Lottie Miller she slowed down to let her other Norwegian athlete um it, a team member go yeah. past because she's already selected to so allow her to get oh it, it's so tactical yeah. now. I mean thankfully for Great Britain women they don't need to worry about all of this because that is done and dusted so Vicky Holland Jess Learmont and Georgia Taylor Brown all qualified before the pandemic really struck and that was a closed deal so they must be sitting back just going they can concentrate on their training <laughs> yeah we also have another exciting weekend of racing to come as you say we have got the Lisbon World Cup that's this coming weekend but also to add to that we have the mixed team relay which some nations are doing their selection from that race for. Okay, and finally, you'll remember last week we spoke about the new Pro Triathlon or PTO stats website that they launched. And since then, I've had a good chance to delve into it. And I've got to say, it's really quite cool. So as soon as the race is finished, Literally, the results are updated. And I think they go back to almost something like 1978 with some awesome. of the, the most iconic kind of race results. But it means that you can see every set of results, the points, the rankings straight after. You can even set athletes side by side and compare them in terms of their I wonder rankings. if athletes are doing it themselves. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm, Oh. See if I'm on there and rank yeah. myself to... Uh, How yeah. much better or worse am I than so-and-so at swimming, cycling and running? Yeah. Am I go on there and see if yeah. I'm better than anyone at anything? Yeah, <laughs> it is, it's a really cool system and we are definitely going to be making use of it here on GTN. So when some of these big races are happening, I think we're just going to throw up on the screen behind us and we're going to have a route through because it is... It is super cool. Yeah, it does. And obviously, like Mark said, you've got the rankings, but you've also got the Collins Cup qualification rankings, which are changing all the time. And they're getting quite exciting now as we're getting close to the end of the qualification period when the teams will be selected. And we've talked about the Collins Cup quite a lot here. And if you guys still don't understand it from our explanation, which is perfectly understandable, there is a really good video that just simplifies it and explains exactly what the Collins Cup is and how the qualification works. We're going to put that uh, link in the description below so you can go and check that out. 
All right, it's time to take a quick look at your photos. Although having said that, we're actually just going to be looking at your videos today because it has been a long show. We've got a couple of just really nice ones. This first one from Kieran. And if you look closely enough, he is riding his giant Propel Advance 1 Disc 2020 in his in Miners Town Beach, County Down, Ireland. And Mark, when you saw this, you did actually ask if it was Ireland, didn't you? It does look just iconically Irish. Yeah. yeah. Well, he says it's his down triathlon club out on their first club ride after lockdown restrictions along a coastal route with the Mourne Mountains backdrop. We also use this area to hold our club training sprint triathlons. Great to be back. Yeah, it oh. certainly is, isn't it? It looks like the kind of destination or area for a triathlon that could be Beautiful on some days, oh. but horrifically windy Well, on the, the, the Ironman in Ireland last year, or whenever it was, that looked pretty horrific, True. didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, next one from Jakob, and this is uh, he's from Innsbruck in Austria, and he is showing off his brand new Canyon Speed Max CF 8.0. Um, he says he recently got this bike and just wanted to test out the speed limits with a friend. And he looks <laughs> he looks good there. Yeah, he, he does. Good. I think he's testing out his aero position and the bike, isn't he? And he's, he's got his friend doing some good filming. I'm yeah. impressed. Awesome. Well, do keep sending in your videos and photos using the photo upload on screen right now or in the description just down below. All right, to kick off the caption competition, we have this photo from last week of Emma Moffat at the Rio Olympics entering the water in style. And we've got a few runners up. First up from E. Foley. When someone says there's free food in the staff kitchen. That's me. <laughs> yeah, it is. So true. <laughs> um, Rebs tries it. said, uh, how to ensure social distancing when entering the water. Nice. And now Eric Omar Pabon Crespo says, now class, I know we are in a triathlon and not yoga class, but we are going to go warrior two now. <laughs> uh, the winner though this week is Dom Lewis. Swim like an Egyptian. Um, yep, yeah, so Dom Lewis, get in touch and we'll ping a cap out to you ASAP. But now for this week's caption comp photo, and it's actually from this weekend at WTS or WTCS <laughs> yeah, Yokohama. Um, it is oh. Casillas. Um, a little bit, Painful. little bit, yeah, a bit of an error trying to put her sunnies on. Hmm. Mm. I've always worried about doing this. and yeah, um, Especially while I was wheeling your bike and, oh, I don't know, leave them on your helmet till you're on the bike, maybe. Yeah. I know, well, who am I to give advice to these athletes on the top yeah. level? Well, get your captions and drop them in the comment section just down below. But that is it for the show this week. We've got loads coming up on the channel. We've got how to break the two minute 100 meter swimming barrier, oh. which is a big, I think that's yeah. a big kind of milestone for a lot of people. Yes. And then also switching from a road bike to a triathlon bike. Yeah, now we've still got a sh uh, sale going on in the shop. It's a 20% off for our spring sale. The swim bike run t-shirts are on there. So you can check that out. The link is on screen now. If you've enjoyed it, give us a like like and do hit that globe and subscribe so you get all of our videos here at GTN. A couple of videos you might want to take a look at if you haven't yet seen Mike, Mike, Mark here does an upgrade from a cheap bike into, well, a super bike. I try to at least. <laughs> I, I think it's a super bike. I'm pretty proud of it. Yeah, check that one out. And there's also how to get Ironman ready if you've got a race coming up. <laughs>